telescopes. They're not built for gravity or neutrino detectors. They're not built for the other things that we're working with. Um, these are a lot of unique one-off pieces of equipment. And so addressing these unique needs of science is something that ResearchSoft was really looking to do. We also have these small and embedded projects. Um, most approaches to monitoring an incident response presume that you own your network. However, a lot of research projects are actually on university networks. Um, for example, a lot of LSST's infrastructure is at Illinois. So they are on the Illinois network. They live there. Illinois owns the network. LSST can do some things, but they are working there on equipment that Illinois owns and Illinois controls. So they have to be able to work within the boundaries that they have. And they can't, they're not a big enough project to roll out entirely their own infrastructure. Um, cyber infrastructure is highly collaborative. There are very few companies out there that are big enough to do these huge transcontinental collaborations. And yet even very small scientific collaborations are often doing this kind of work. Um, there are specialized skills involved in this work, and this is very difficult for science projects to recruit and develop heavily. Um, we're very lucky in that large facilities are starting to have information security officers and small teams. It's great that they have an information security officer and maybe one or two security engineers. That doesn't mean that you have a dedicated forensics expert and a dedicated IDS engineer and so on and so forth. There are a lot of specialties involved in really robust detection and incident handling. And so when we were thinking about research SOC and how to handle these challenges, we came up with a strategy that was really tuned for science. Um, and our goals are pretty simple, to improve the cybersecurity posture of scientific cyber infrastructure and to raise awareness of the real threats that we're facing in our community. So we put together some technological pieces. We have OmniSoc, which is a traditional security operations center. It pulls in network and systems logs. It has an analysis engine, and it's got security engineers that work around the clock to understand what that means and know when someone really needs to be alerted. Um, Three Rocks in specific is giving us a vulnerability identification service that I'll talk about a little later. Um, it helps you know what on your network you need to be concerned about and what you should be patching. And Stinger is a system for deploying honeypots in a really methodical and automated manner. This gives projects that maybe don't control their entire network the chance to get visibility they wouldn't have had otherwise. And putting this together with all of that tuning and making sure that it's right for scientific equipment and then bringing it together with training and community so that we're not leaving PIs like our fictional Maria out in the cold wondering what's going to happen next. We're making sure that things are not just built for them, but they're, they and their staff are getting trained on it and that they're getting the threat intelligence and constant communication they need to make it work for their project. So, we also made sure that we can work at different scales. We can work all the way from the large facilities to, wow, that slide is missing, to much smaller projects that are apparently not on a slide right now. I apologize for that. So the OmniSoc I mentioned is more of what we think of as a traditional security operations center. 24-7, um, 365 operations, there is always a human being in OmniSoc. They are always looking at the data. And it's a great combination of bringing in all of this telemetry, but also having multiple threat analysis feeds. And OmniSoc benefits from all of the threat intelligence they're getting through their normal global NOC feeds, plus a lot of ICS and SCADA threat intelligence that ResearchSoc has been gathering. And so they can take all of that threat intelligence and turn it into, well, what do we look for on the network? What do we look for on our systems? What are the signs of compromise we should be aware of? What are the things that we should consider normal operation for the type of equipment that we're looking at? 
And it also lets them analyze security events, not just in one place, but across organizations. So within OmniSoc, um, we're standing up a data stack that is specific to ResearchSoc. So that ResearchSoc client data is separate from the Big Ten schools that were originally part of OmniSoc. Um, I'll get into why we did that in a little bit. Um, part of it is so that we can share some of what we're learning with researchers into cybersecurity and improve the practice of cybersecurity in a really broad way. Um, but also for our clients, it means that if one client starts getting hit with something new and weird that we didn't find out about from threat intelligence because we're the first place it's happening, we can start to see that really quickly when it hits one, two, three of our clients because we're not just looking at one client's data at a time, we're also correlating events that we're seeing across clients. And this really helps because it means that we can respond more quickly and more comprehensively. Um, everybody tries to fix all the vulnerabilities, but an attacker only needs to find one. And to help with that, we've got Three Rocks. So Three Rocks is based on something called OpenVAS, which is an open source vulnerability scanning system that you may have heard of. Um, basically, Three Rocks has a system for loading up OpenVAS with a lot of vulnerability definitions, um, many of them open source, some of them proprietary, and performing scans on demand. Um, this can give you common misconfigurations. Hey, you have a default password on this service. Um, or, hey, you have an open port that probably shouldn't be open. Um, exploitable software. By the way, did you know you're running Apache Struts? Did you know that Apache Struts has a new security vulnerability every time we turn around? This is probably not something you want to keep on your network in the long term. Um, unnecessary services and exposed devices. Um, did you know that your mass spectrometer is visible to the internet? Um, did you know that there is a web server running on your telescope? Um, things that people just may not be aware of. It also can show you things that need patches because you have, you have software that should be relatively secure and it's well configured, but there's a publicly known security vulnerability in that software. It's visible from the outside and you haven't patched it yet. So when we onboard someone to VIS or the Vulnerability Identification Service with Three Rocks, we also can do an, what we call a discovery scan. Um, a lot of projects that we work with don't know very well what they're dealing with and what's on their network. Um, I can tell you as an information security officer, when I came on to Open Science Grid, there were definitely things in Open Science Grid's infrastructure that I didn't know about when I came on. It was really good to do some serious reconnaissance and find out what we had. Um, and then doing scheduled scanning or on-demand scanning to make sure that we're regularly tightening things up, getting rid of software vulnerabilities and finding new vulnerabilities. Um, when we're looking at small to medium embedded projects, Viz is great in that it can pick up software vulnerabilities. OmniSoc is difficult for a lot of these projects because they can't necessarily control enough of their network equipment to ship out all of the information we would need to make full use of OmniSoc's capabilities. But these small and embedded projects benefit more from Stinger, I think, than our larger projects do. Um, Stinger is a system that lets you set up honeypots. So those of you who are not familiar with honeypots, um, a honeypot is a system that is meant to be attacked. Um, when an attacker is looking around a network, they're looking for something with known vulnerabilities, they're looking for something that looks like it's connected to more than one network, and they're looking for something that is otherwise a good place to use as their home base, for lack of a better term, to attack other systems. Um, we call it owning one system and pivoting to attack another. And so they may be scanning for a particular vulnerability, They've accessed a system. This is now something where they've created an admin account or taken something over, and then they attack more machines. Um, 
This can be difficult to catch when you don't have the kind of advanced monitoring that we've set up through OmniSat. But what you can do is this computer with the red box around it, the one that they come in through, what if you can know what computer that will be? And what if you can get information from it once it gets attacked? That's basically how a honeypot works. What we do with a honeypot is we create a very attractive system that attackers will want to at least look at and touch, if not try to compromise. And it has enough sensors and logging and other ways to ship out data that we're going to find out once something happens to it. This is a system that's never used for any real work. That's why it's called a honeypot. It's just there to be a distraction. So I can walk you through the network maps and different ways that this can show up in different networks. But the important thing is, you know, you see these little spyglass computers. They're sitting right there in your DMZ or in your campus network or in other places where you want to know if someone's in there. And we can find out if someone's hit it and that can ship data back to research SOC and give you really useful information on what's going on in your network. Too often when we see compromises, even in places like the financial sector that have a lot more resources than science do and a great deal more confidentiality and integrity concerns than we do, they aren't finding compromises for months or over a year. Um, when we're in a position where we don't own our network, the, one of the fastest ways to find out that you've already been compromised is with a honeypot. So alert data, um, blocking on threat intelligence from external sources, blocking on internally developed intelligence, so what we're looking at is, I don't know how well you can see the graph behind the informational bubble here, but the group leveraging Stinger in this test case was able to go from 10, uh, basically a little over 10 and a half million alerts to about three quarters of a million alerts. And I believe this was per month. Yeah, it says at the bottom. So what happens is, okay, we're getting less alerts, great. Well, assuming that you're still alerting on the right things, what this means is you have to filter through a lot less noise to get to what really matters. And this really makes a big difference with intelligence because now we know more about what we're looking for. Um, this was an experiment Duke did with looking at which attacks and attackers were common across 30 days of Stinger data from four different institutions. That's Duke and three of their partners. And it was really interesting to see how few of those attacks were actually overlapping. Um, and one could look at, you know, the 0.3% of attacks that were actually hitting all four institutions, and all four of these are higher ed. That's a good place to look for either very higher ed targeted attacks or things that are very broad and trying to hit the whole internet. Susan, there's a question. Um, I can check with Duke and find out if they have published the alert data on their Stinger project. I don't know if they have that published or not yet. Um, so just to get an idea of how Stinger fits into the greater research SOC package, um, Stinger deploys honeypots to identify malicious traffic. This is something attractive. It has a lot of great sensors on it. It gives us good data. This gets fed back to the research SOC and our lab for active response. This means that we can tell you what to block, but it also means that we can correlate it with information we got from our vulnerability scans that we did through the vulnerability identification service. So now we know, hey, you're attracting these kinds of bad guys because you still have those open vulnerabilities that you haven't fixed yet. You need to bring this to your leadership and get the resources to fix it. And now you have data to back up that request. Um, there is a measure of, so I got another question. Is there a measure of human effort to use the cross-partner intelligence? Um, so this, it, the answer is yes and no. There is human effort involved. The good news is that I'd say about 80% of that effort is on research SOC side. We're doing that for our clients through their subscriptions, so that's not something they have to staff up for. Um, 
always the more intelligence you get if you actually want to act on it. You need to have the manpower to write a new firewall rule or remediate vulnerabilities in systems and do the response. But in general, as far as correlating this information and things like that, um, we are handling that within research stocks so that our clients are really just looking to act on the intelligence and not trying to figure out how to correlate it and decide what its meaning is, which is a lot of the work, believe it or not. Um, so we're also, I, I mentioned earlier that we have a separate DAF stack within OmniSoc compared to what they had originally built for the Big Ten, and this is a big part of the reason why. We want to enable cybersecurity research. So some of the data being collected by research SOC from our clients, um, in keeping with the privacy contracts that those clients have signed with research SOC and so on, is being made available to select cybersecurity researchers so that they can improve on the methods we use for intrusion detection and prevention, network and threat analysis, security and privacy policies, and any other area in cybersecurity where we think that we can help researchers improve the state of practice, not just for research SOC, but across the industry. Um, that's something that researchers can really struggle with because you know, we are, because Research SOC is actively searching research communities, we have a shared community value of wanting to support further research. So we have a group within Research SOC that's actively surveying the needs of cybersecurity researchers, figuring out what data they need, figuring out how best to provide secure access to data that's not just something engineers like me are happy with, but that researchers find usable and to build awareness of this data and its potential because too often researchers get data that is so obfuscated as to be useless or um, data that's simulated rather than real data from real locations that are doing real work and that can often um, sort of distort what they're trying to do with cybersecurity because they're not looking at the real thing. Um, so at this point we've been working with um, surveys and interviews of researchers. We have a student engagement workshop planned for spring of 2020 and in spring of 2021 we have a researcher engagement workshop that should start getting um, students and researchers working with the data and hopefully we'll get some good results from that. Um, so we talked earlier about the specialized skills needed to really work with intrusion detection systems in terms of understanding the data and then using it to do incident response. Um, so we do have a prong of this effort led by Mike Korn out of UCSD that's reaching out to information security offices throughout higher ed to help them better understand the needs of research on their campus. Unfortunately, most of the embedded projects that we deal with either have information security offices at their home institutions that are very hands-off. They say, oh, well, this is research. This is outside of my purview. The higher ed networks are my, are my concern. And so they're not, um, they don't see research as impacting what they care about, and they're not very supportive. Um, and then we have the opposite, which is, look, we're here to educate. We have business networks that handle tuition payments and student information and health information and all this stuff we're concerned about, we're going to tell research what you can and can't do. And if it's something different than what we have on our enterprise networks, you're just out of luck. And neither of those extremes is healthy for research or healthy for the higher education institution that depends on those research grants to keep their educational efforts healthy and to keep the research engine at the university moving. But a lot of times these extremes happen because we're dealing with information security offices that don't really understand what the research on their campus is doing and we want to help with that. Um, classical enterprise security is very straightforward compared to research support. Research support, is it, it's a lot. I, I compare it, I, I realize we have a wonderful custom built car analogy here, but I prefer calling it the difference between being a traffic cop and being a ninja. Um, the traffic cop is very good at doing things in an orderly manner and keeping everything tamped down and making everyone follow the rules. 
Um, the ninja is there to deal with the bizarre situations that no one really planned for and to do it with an amazing amount of skill. So here are some workshops. Um, the three-day workshop in San Diego last December. I'm sorry you all missed your opportunity to spend winter in San Diego. Um, but we have a number of conference aligned workshops coming up, including one at PERC, which is in a couple of weeks, if anyone's interested. Um, this is really targeting CISO security architects and security professionals at institutions that have research. Um, our community of practice is a great place for anyone who has an interest in cybersecurity for science. Um, the um, part of this is for our clients. Joining our community of practice includes a REN ISAC membership that helps onboard you to learning resources and threat intelligence there. But even if you have not become a research SOC client, um, there is a URL that I'm going to drop in chat as soon as I get better at multitasking here, which is our public community of practice. There we go. And this is something that even without um, joining Research SOC, anyone can get access to. Feel free to show up, create a free account and talk to us. Um, at least once a day, a security analyst from Research SOC is checking this and answering questions. It's a great place to ask for help with a problem that you're facing or a question that you have, or to get feedback on an idea or to share something you've learned. The idea here is really to create a co community of people who are working with cybersecurity in the science community, regardless of whether they work for one of our clients or not. This is one of our broader impacts. Um, speaking of clients, we've got four clients who have agreed to be our guinea pigs, for lack of a better term. Um, NRAO, Gemini Observatory, um, GAGE, I'm not sure where the letter E went, but um, GAGE through UNAVCO. Um, all of these have been wonderfully good sports as we're developing our contracts, our technologies, our outreach processes, our onboarding systems. Um, I've been really happy with the fact that we're not just putting in work, they're putting in some work so that everyone who comes after them gets a much easier, smoother experience. Um, but we've our, we started this project in late 2018. Um, in 2019, we're doing a lot of development of the program and beginning to get our beta clients on. Um, 2020 is going to really be focused on the beta clients and any really early clients who want to come in after that. And from 2021 on, this is a sustainability program. Um, NSF has said that they will be very open to follow on proposals from especially large facilities and mid-scale projects that are interested in research SOC services to get the security that they need um, and to make sure that those projects are funded to subscribe to this as a subscription service. Um, so I actually made better time than I thought I was trying to end at 20 till. Um, feel free to ask me any other questions that you have. Um, this is something that's still a work in progress, but it's a work in progress that I've been really happy to be a part of because I think that it's been hard for science projects because science projects are very concerned with doing the business of science. And when these science projects are asked to do complex cybersecurity operations, um, a, a similar private sector project, a similarly sized private sector organization goes out and they say, okay, I'm going to outsource this to you know, J random contractor and it'll be fine. They have a service for this and it's a great service and it's packaged up and it exists for, it's existed for a long time and they have specialists. Science hasn't always been able to do that because we don't just operate on enterprise tech and we don't just operate on our own networks. Um, the distributed nature of science, the frequency with which small and medium projects are embedded on campuses, and the sheer diversity of technologies and equipments we work with um, is pretty impressive. So it looks like we have another question. Is research SOC being discussed or presented at EDUCAUSE to reach CISOs of higher education? 
So we were at the last EDUCAUSE um, Security Professionals Conference. I don't know whether they plan to be at the main EDUCAUSE Conference or not, or if they're just focusing on security professionals. I, I have a question. Um, so this, this is Matthias. I'm, I'm, I'm part of the LSST um, project. And I was wondering about, about those two uh, clients you mentioned that are very familiar to me, Gemini and, and NRAO. So how did that happen? How, how did that initial engagement happen is my first question. Uh, my second question is, so Gemini uh, Observatory is part of uh, a bigger organization which is called Aura that mm -hmm. also has some other telescopes. So I, I, I wasn't aware of this, this you know, um, little contract or little thing going on. Um, I was wondering whether is that is only particular to this uh, observatory, and you, you and, and what kind of work are you guys plan to do? Are you because you mentioned at some point in your talk that there might be you know a telescope with open either open ports or open web servers or you know with you know some vulnerabilities that you might not know. So what kind of work are you expecting to do with them? Because to my understanding, you haven't you haven't started just yet, right? Right, we're just beginning to onboard these clients in August. So we're still in the process of building and integrating services for them right now. Um, so these four clients actually signed on when we were proposing the, when we were doing the grant proposal with NSF. Um, we selected these projects for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that we wanted to get enough of a cross section of things that NSF has to worry about that NSF would uh, would believe that we'd successfully created a service that is applicable to the full breadth of large facilities and mid-scale projects. Um, these are all projects that have fairly different needs and it includes things like Gemini that are under Aura, um, Gage which is under a private uh, services, I, I forget how UNAVCO is organized, but they're like a private organization that contracts with NSF. Um, NRAO, which is a little bit more of a traditional science organization as opposed to either something with a private partnership like UNAVCO or something like Gemini, Gemini that's two-tiered under Aura. Um, and then um, the National Resource for Translational and Developmental Proteomics, which thank God, it, it took us like the first week to all learn to say proteomics correctly. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the proteomics lab was really our example of an embedded project because they don't own any of their own networks. Um, as opposed to, for example, LSST, some of your stuff's at Illinois, some of your stuff you own. Um, proteomics doesn't own any of their own networks, so they're really our test case for that. Um, we were very lucky that they were all flexible enough to want to sign on to this before we'd even been awarded the grant. So um, we're following through with them first. I, I'm hoping that after we get Gemini up and running, that'll be a proof of concept that makes Aura want to get the other telescopes on this service. I think that especially for the telescopes, this can be really helpful. Right. Yeah, I was wondering about that. And I, I think you, you, you handpicked all these projects very, very carefully to have a, I know, a large spread of of cases and, and, and scenarios which is which is which is great. But and, and so my, my, my other question was, you know, what kind of work are you expecting to do um, in particular related to you know the telescope and the and the instruments that they manage uh, at these two observatories? So the biggest thing that's specific to the telescopes is the work that we're doing with ICS and SCADA technologies. Um, so when I say ICS and SCADA, what I mean is what people call control systems. Um, the stuff that makes the telescope move, the stuff that makes the telescope focus, the stuff that makes the ceiling open so that the telescope can stick out and point at the sky. Um, all of these things that can, all of these co small computing devices that control physical world objects are called control systems or ICS SCADA components. And one of the challenges that science faces is we have a lot of these components, but they're very delicate. They're very delicate, and in a way, they're kind of stupid. Um, and I don't mean that, that the people who design them are stupid. I mean that the devices aren't very intelligent from a networking standpoint. Um, many of these components don't have any kind of authentication before you reprogram them. 
Um, right. So working, knowing what to monitor, what to filter, what to block. Um, Gemini is a great team to work with because they actually have a control system specialist who's full time at Gemini, and that's all that he does. Um, he's a great guy to work with, but Research Sock has been working really hard to bring in intelligence for passive monitoring of ICS and SCADA equipment. Because I'll tell you right now, it is not safe to use something like Viz and actively scan ICS and SCADA networks. Um, there are ICS and SCADA components that if you ping them, they will DDoS everything in their vicinity. It's terrible, but it's how some of it works because a lot of this is equipment that was designed in the days of electrical communication analog before we had digital networks and then somebody stuck a conversion card on it and connected it to a TCP IP network. Um, so we're really working on carefully profiling these things so that by passive listening, we can tell what's going on with them from the network without introducing any new risks to the network. And that's something we've spent a lot of time building into research stock that most of the commercial um, security operations centers just don't have. So did that answer your question? Yes, that's that's very interesting. I, I wasn't I wasn't fully aware of what's uh, you know what's the work it was it was planning for that. And I understand that it's more you know about safety and, and integrity rather than you know external attackers you know getting and try to control the telescope from outside. Right. Because absolutely. I, I think I think there's there's also there's always some some risk about that too. But thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Um, so the next question I'm seeing here is they're asking, are any parts of the inner workings of research stock proprietary? Have paper, are there papers we can reference on the technology? How does it compare to commercial threat intelligence platforms? Um, okay, so three questions. Are any of our inner workings proprietary? None of the technologies we are using are proprietary. However, some of our threat intelligence is. Um, we're getting threat intelligence from a lot of different places now, ranging from Ren ISAC to some of OmniSoc's um, Big Ten partners to um, some proprietary ICS and SCADA threat intelligence feeds that we're only allowed to share in very limited ways. Um, but none of the technology that we're using to do this is proprietary. And whenever we get threat intelligence, we try to get it under the most open sharing agreements that we possibly can. Um, but sometimes we have to make a decision that it's better for our clients to have information, even if we can't share it with the world, than for our clients not to have the intelligence they need to protect themselves. Um, as far as papers you can reference, um, a lot of these are just commodity technologies that you can Google. Um, OmniSoc is built on an ELK stack with a lot of automation around it. Um, you can find information on that in papers and technical books. Um, it, it's pretty easy to search up on the internet. Um, our vulnerability identification service is built on OpenVAS. That's O-P-E-N-V-A-S. Um, OpenVAS.org has a trove of information on that. Um, Stinger is built on two different technologies for honeypot deployment that I'm forgetting right now. But if you go back to the Stinger website, which was at, let's see if I can find that slide quickly. There's their logo. Okay, it's no longer on the logo so slide, but if you go to researchsoc.iu.edu and follow links through the Stinger, you will find the information on the different um, Basically, for honeypots, they're using Linux distributions that were built to be honeypots, and then they've just instrumented them to send the information back to OmniSoc. Um, compared to commercial threat intelligence platforms, I think that there are three things that make us really different. One is this focus on ICS and SCADA. We can deal with your scientific equipment. We're not going to just ignore it. We're ready to monitor your telescope. We're ready to monitor your mass spectrometer. We're ready to monitor your neutrino detectors. We're ready for anything you throw at us. Um, the second thing is that we don't just set up alerts and give you a panel. There, every project that signs on to research stock has a project liaison who personally contacts them and says, hey, you may have a problem. This is what we're looking at. And they're personally there to answer questions so that you're not trying to contact 
individual people who run individual technologies, you always have someone who runs that. And when we onboard you, we're not just assuming that you have every piece of needed expertise, it comes with training. Um, so that level of service, because we've found that science organizations vary greatly in their cybersecurity maturity in different areas, um, being ready to bring up the cybersecurity maturity of the organizations we engage with and help them use the research stock effectively is a second big part of what we do that's special. And the third part is how we work with the science community overall and the academic community because we do have the outreach to campus CISOs to help those relationships work better and help research projects leverage the cybersecurity resources for the campuses they're affiliated with and to help researchers access this data and make cybersecurity better for the whole industry and also to get different people from our special little vertical, from people who are doing security around science. We have a lot of venues to try to get them together. Um, we will be at Trusted CI's NSF Cybersecurity Summit. Um, we go out to EDUCAUSE security professionals um, and as many other venues as we can to just help people connect and make sure that people within our community are sharing their lessons learned. Um, is this research SOC workshop available for people outside of IU? Let's see which research SOC. Um, well, that particular edition of the research SOC workshop happened last December, so if you have a time machine, I'd be happy to include you. Um, but we are happy to run it again at other campuses, if that's what you're asking, um, to actually attend in Oh no, this one's December 2019. I thought that was the 2018 one. I apologize, I didn't realize which page I was looking at. Um, yes, this one's at UC San Diego and anybody from any campus can sign up. My apologies, I thought we were looking at the one from last December. But yeah, go to the page, sign up. If the sign up isn't open, um, feel free to just email. Um, research sock at iu.edu and we'll make sure that we get you hooked up with it. So any other questions? You guys have me captive for like 10 more minutes. Grill me. Yes, if there's no more questions, we can earn or end early. Okay. So, I have one, okay, last question, one last, one last question ahead. about, you know, um, this, this, this particular project. So you, you say you just got funded. So for, for how long is the initial um, funding for the research talk? So the initial funding from NSF gives us three years. So that started in October of 2018, and that gives us basically um, a year to bootstrap ourselves and start onboarding clients, um, a year of service paid for by NSF for those four initial clients who have agreed to be our guinea pigs, and then a year to sort of help support our operations while all of our clients shift into a paid mode. And then at that point, we're paid for by the projects that we're serving. Right. That's a good model. Thank you. Any more questions for Susan? Okay, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.